We're gonna check out Mod Series Shocks today at QA1. But first, watch this. All right, so we are at QA1 still today. If you saw the first video, we did a shot tour. We got to see all the good stuff. But now we are here with Max. He is going to talk about Mod Series Shocks. We run them on the 55, the Camaro, all kinds of other projects. Pretty nice piece. Wait, I read Mod Series. So what's the point? Does it say, it says Mod Series on there. I want to know, is that like, Mod is the Mod Squad? Are you guys the Mod Squad? Not quite. We could be the Mod Squad. <laughs> yeah, there we, we are. certainly we're gonna, could. We're going to do fixed yeah, crimes. And, so, no, so is it, does that mean like, Mod means hip? In my world, in my time, we've kind of worked past that lingo. It's hip. Yeah, we're, we're past that now. We're, we're talking modular, as in oh. modular valve packs in the show. Okay, it's not modern or mod. It's, mo it's modular. modular. Meaning it's multiple pieces. Yeah. Okay, got it. Good job. Let's say Paige. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. So with that, mod series shock. Yeah. Now that we know that it's modular, we talk, let's talk about it. Yeah, so this is. Uh, Kind of an iconic piece for us, uh, mod shocks, essentially, like we said, modular. We've got modular valve packs in there giving us endless valving capabilities. It's a four-way adjustable shock, so we've got control of our rebound and compression, both high speed and low speed. Um, so not only for the true racer, but the daily driver, you can dial this in for the ultimate performance and ultimate comfort. Um, we've got our valve packs, both compression and rebound, on the outside there, and then we've got control of our low speed bleed in the center with a couple of uh, flathead screws uh, to dial that in. And this is, you know, another piece to touch on with modular is it's essentially a hybrid shock. So we've got a lot of the benefits of a twin tube shock with really low rod pressure, um, but all the benefits of a monotube shock and gas charge shock. So it's very fast acting, high flow. Um, and it allows us to, to really dial this in for, for any application. So we'll get into a little bit more the, the technical side of that coming up, but one thing to highlight, you talk about the valve, mm -hmm. and for those that may have heard of valving shocks or having them revalve, you're taking those off your car and you're sending them in somewhere to get that different adjustment. That's something that's very, very special about this piece. If you want to just elaborate on that. Exactly, yeah. So each one of these valve packs is held on with five little Allen head screws. And instead of taking this to a shock builder to have it reworked, we ship these with what we call our standard valve packs. And we've got options to go firmer or softer, either direction with five of those screws. We're swapping those out right on the car. Saves us time, saves us money, um, keeps you going down the track. Yeah, and something really cool is, like I mentioned, we have them on the 55, we have them on the Savoy, uh, that's on Hot Rod Rod, we have them on my Camaro, we have them on a lot of different project cars that, you know, we work with. They were on Bumblebee, the car that I raised for Radio Versus the World. Lots of time spent with these, yep. really good piece, but before we dive into some of the uh, technical side of it, something to note is something we're seeing now with uh, drag and driving pins and drag and drive tracks and we'll get into this is we have a lot of different track prep that we're not used to running on for a big tire or radial versus big tire so there's slick tire there's a lot of different stuff going on and we have been talking and discussing and that's kind of a new issue we may be seeing that may be something that would be really good to address with these uh you think we could dive into going to look at how these are put together and then absolutely there. yeah we could throw them on the dyno talk about what our adjustments are and what they do for us. Um, there's a lot of a lot of people that are thrown off by four-way adjustable. Where do I start? Where do I finish? What does each adjustment give me? Um, and being able to break that down application specific can be really helpful. Okay, just, we're gonna do it. We're going to dyno. We're gonna go build them, dyno them, and then talk some more. So we got dad back in here now that we've got the mod situation figured out. <laughs> All right, so we're going to start by showing how a shock is built, the Mod Series shock. This is Dad's land. This is my thing. I mean, I've already asked what material they use. Dead yeah. curious. Okay, you want to tell us? Yeah, absolutely. So looking at our base assembly, it's going to start out as a raw piece of 6061 aluminum. Um, it gets fed into this machine here behind us, and we'll go through 
all the workings. Um, it's about a 10 minute process to get us to this point. And then it's gonna spit it out here onto this tray. And we can essentially harvest them at that point. And that was awesome to have a perfect example of one shooting out for us there. And from there, this is gonna go out for anodizing. And then it's gonna be reworked again um, to create that whole base assembly to where it's gonna accept those valve packs. So pretty neat process. So while this is a different part that just popped out, for those that understand machining and what's going on there, and you're gonna, you really love this, for the fact that that's made in 10 minutes in one machine without changing stuff in and out, that's impressive. Refixturing. I mean, there's every angle of that. Every 360 degrees around that, it's got something going on. It's not round like that. Yeah. So to do that all in one process is amazing. Come, come this way. Sorry for the awkward mic. We can only run two at a time. Uh, so here, just zoom in real quick so you can see all the different passages, different pieces that are threaded, all of that. And that just pops out the machine, right? Everything's like just... got an internal thread. And then you look, and that's machined at an angle inside there. It's not just an open cut. So that's a, that's impressive. All in house. That's jewelry. I'd wear that on my my finger. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's step one. Let's go on to the next step. All right. So once you go from this base, what's up next? What's up next? We've got basically a sub assembly station. So after this gets sent out for anodizing, it's going to come back over here. Sandro's working on building some base assemblies right now. This is also where we assemble the valve packs themselves. So we've got a whole slew of small little miscellaneous components that all get worked into this piece. And the reason we build it as a sub-assembly is when we go on the line, we don't want to be taking all these little pieces going one by one just to build a shock, or we'll be there all day doing that. This way we can get these built, stocked on the shelves, and ready for final assembly when we're going to put the shot together. That's cool. On a side note, mm -hmm. uh, for those at home, when you can buy different valve packs, but when you get it from you guys, does it come with just one or can you request a different valving? How does that work? Yeah, so off the shelf, it's gonna come with our standard valve packs. We've got soft compression, soft rebound, a firm compression, a firm rebound, and then there is an extra firm rebound option as well. You could run it on the compression side. The only problem is it's gonna have a C on it instead of an R, you're gonna be back and forth. So keeping that straight, the only nice thing is, is we do machine in a C and an R on the side of the base itself, so you can keep that straight if you did ever really want to. But the valves are the same, they just label different. Just label different, yeah. yep, yep. But in an Absolutely. emergency situation. You can flip flop however you want, yeah. Absolutely. Good note, okay. Yep. All right, so those go on the shelf and then get stocked and then what's next? What's next? We're gonna put a shock together. Cool. All right, so a bunch of different stuff happens in this area. So a mod series shock isn't necessarily being assembled right this second, but imagine a mod series shock went through assembly and now where are we? We are at the final stages of it. So we've got a, a tote full of shocks that were built here and now they're gonna come over to the dyno and they're gonna get our base loop put on with our little five Allen screws on the top of it here. And then we can do a run on the dyno because every one of the shocks that we make here has a part number, but also a serial number. And we run every single one on the dyno so that we can make sure that we built this to spec and it's gotta fall within a certain set of parameters. Otherwise it's gonna get a red light and we've gotta take it back apart and kinda of see where we went wrong. The really cool thing with that is we're able to keep track of that. So if a customer, say, ordered a specific valving for a circle track shot, say a 3-5 valving, we can go back five years from now, pull that serial number up and see exactly how it was on the dyno when it left our floor, see who built it at what time. We've got record of all that stuff, which is pretty darn cool. Even just storing that information sounds like a big task. Yeah, that's awesome. Nothing to Absolutely. hide, it's all serialized. So it looks like he's putting the final pieces on and about to put it on the dyno here if we want to step up and take a look at that. That one's done, all right. Well, that one's going in for a bath now. Um, so every one of our shocks, after we run it on the dyno, um, they get sent down this conveyor belt. So they're gonna have a little bit of shock oil on them. So we give them a nice bath, dry them off. And then we'll take a look at them over in boxing and see kind of the final steps there. So I have a question. 
-hmm. when you get uh, your dyna the graphs in the box with your shots, those are actually more of a generalized graph, not your specific graph, correct? Exactly, okay. yeah. So what we include in the mod shocks, for example, is in the instructions, we've got basic settings for drag application, road course racing, street driving, and then we show those force curves for each tuning guide or tuning pack. Um, so through the entire adjustment range, you've got a visual representation of what that shock is capable of at a given setting, which is super, super helpful. And this is just making sure that it falls within that those parameters. Exactly. Okay. Gotcha. Yep. So now we can see the shock is going on the dyno here, getting that all rigged up. And then on the computer screen, we can see our compression curve up top, and the rebound is down at the bottom there. And when we run this shock, we've got to make sure that we fall in between those dotted red lines. We give ourselves about a 50 pound buffer, um, plus or minus each way, uh, to make sure you know we're satisfactory on the build there. So there he's just checking to make sure our settings were matching what we're testing here. And now it's go time. So now here's where we'll enter in the serial number so that we can save it accurately and know what we're tracing it back to. So he's gonna peek underneath, take a look at the closure nut on the reservoir is where we laser etch that in and we'll update that file. And now we can see, we got our shock on the screen there. It looks like we're a little firm on the rebound side of things. So we'll take a look at what went wrong there. As we know, QA1 stands for quality, affordability being the number one priority. So if something doesn't meet those numbers, we're gonna rework that shock, which he's doing right now, to make sure that matches that curve. So perfect example of why we check things before we ship it out, because nobody's gonna bat a thousand um, and hit a home run every single time, so. All right, now after it goes through quality control, it's been assembled, all that good stuff, you're a big fan of the box here. I am, I love packaging. <laughs> packaging is like machining. I mean, somebody had to put a lot of thought into how to make this package and they did really good. And with that said, after we get through all that, now yep. we're here. We are here, and to your point, we actually have an engineer in here that specifically yeah. works on designing packaging for everything that we send out of here. So we'll open this box up, and we can see we've got our tuning guide up top here. Um, all your instructions, everything like that are included. We've got our spring seat here. We've got our top cap for retaining the spring. And then obviously here is where all the magic happens. So we've got our shock nicely held in place in there with our foam. Everything's all clean, dry, free of any oil. And then underneath here, we've also got a couple little accessory bags, um, some spacers for your mounts. Some thrust bearings are included with that as well. And then an Allen wrench and your set screw to lock your spring seat in place. And that's packaged so well. It could come off the UPS truck, fly across your shop, end on it, and it's still going to be safe. You're correct. That's very quality right there. Yeah, and another big thing we talked about, you know, on the dyno, we were chasing that green light, right? We had to fall within those certain parameters. We try to stick to those same standards and do a pretty darn good job of it over in packaging as well. When we're boxing these up, every single box has to go on the scale here and get a green light before we can send it off to its final destination on the shelf. And it would pick up, if I miss this bag of these four little spacers, it's gonna give me a red light and let me know, you gotta open this thing back up because we're missing yeah, something. Wrong. Yep. Okay. That's, That's impressive. Uh, with that said, now that we've gone through building it, let's go back over to the world where the dyno is yep. and let's dive into that and get a little more technical on what's going on with this. Absolutely, let's go take another walk. Like what, explain. Explain what's going on here. Yeah, absolutely. So we got the shock set up on the dyno. Yeah. Um, just for our baseline test, I'm doing 10 clicks of compression, 10 clicks of rebound, leaving our low speed adjustment wide open. And that way we can really see what happens as soon as we start making adjustments with that. Okay. So 
Got it rigged up. We'll zero out the load cell on there to make sure we're getting an accurate reading. And we can get this thing started When you say up. 10 clicks, you mean 10 clicks from type. Is that backed off 10 clicks? or? So that's going to be, that? yep, from full soft. We're going to go all the way counterclockwise is our full soft or zero position. And tighten it up 10 clicks. Yep, 10 clicks clockwise from there. And we'll give this thing a go. <laughs> and so as it runs, it's going to target different speeds and that's how it's going to plot out the graph on here. So you'll see it ramp up and slow down um, as it runs through its progression. How long is a cycle for this machine? Uh, for this test, it's about a 30 second ordeal. Like desert racing. <laughs> Baja truck. There's our low speed movements. Yep, so the way I have this test set up is our highest shaft speed is going to be 10, inch, 10 inches per second. Um, we can go really to whatever we want. Um, 15, I think, is a pretty common number to target in a drag racing application. Um, but for the sake of the length of the, length of the test, we'll just, uh, just run it at 10 inches a second. And we'll save this data here. So as it pops up here, this isn't typically a graph that we're going to look at. Um, so what I'm going to switch it to is our force versus absolute velocity. So now what we've got here um, we've got our force in pounds running on the side there, and then this is our shaft speed along the bottom. So all the way to the left is zero inches per second, all the way to the right is that 10 inches per second number that I referenced. And as we look at the graph over on the left here, this is our zero point. And anything underneath this, this line running here, that's going to be our rebound force, and everything up here that's our compression force. So like I mentioned before, when we leave our bleeds open, we're essentially going for a linear curve. So as shaft speed increases, our force increases. So you can see this line is picking up force, whether it be the rebound or the compression side, as we go faster. Um, and linear is where it's one to one. Correct, as it's increased, like a straight line. Look. Essentially, Correct. yep, okay. yep, that's okay. exactly right. So what we'll do now, we're gonna leave it at 10 clicks for each of them. And for the sake of just a good illustration of it, we'll add two turns of low speed bleed. So we're gonna close off our low speed. So look at this, Meg. Yep, so okay. we've got a locking plate here in the center, which is what this screw is. On the left side, it corresponds with our compression. So we'll put our flathead in, and we can give it a half, one, half, and two turns there. And then on our rebound side, we'll do the same, half and two. And then we'll wanna lock that back down. And as I mentioned before, we've got three and a half turns of adjustment. Um, it will hit a hard stop on the way out, so we know where our zero point is pretty easily. And it's a lot easier to index these since it's a flathead screw. Um, previous designs we had, it was just an Allen key in there. So it was a lot easier to keep track of where that line was. Um, so now that we've got that dialed in there, we don't have to mess with anything else. We can simply run the test again, make sure our load cell zeroed out. And just to, to clarify, you mm -hmm. backed it out where it's bleeding more or no, less. Less, closed yep, so we closed it, it. Okay. yep. It is, yeah. So what it uses down on the bottom is called a, a Scotch yoke. Um, that's the that's the device that's actually driving it down there. Oh, okay. And so as I mentioned before, you know the convenience factor of these shocks to have all of that adjustment right there on that, especially with the modular valve packs. 
with a standard shock to make the changes that we can make just on the car, a shock builder would be taking this on the bench, completely mm -hmm. gutting the shock, starting over with new shim stacks, um, just to try and reach these target numbers where we can simply play with clicks and a flathead screw, which that's is a, super, super convenient. That took so cool. 20 seconds max, and that you were explaining it to us at the same time, okay. so. So now, once we save this, we'll see this come up on the screen, and I'll change the color of these just so they're a little bit easier to see. So we'll take our first run, make that red, and now we can see with those two turns added, how much that force curve changed. And as I mentioned before, you know, when we do that, we're gonna see a little bit of that high speed number change. So for example, with our rebound force down the bottom right corner, we're looking at a 20 pound difference in force, mm -hmm. but we're reaching these numbers a lot quicker, right? So whereas before in a very traditional weight transfer speed of say three inches per second, we look at it, and we're right around 125 pounds before we made our adjustment. Now we're really only at about 140 pounds, but we can see down at one inch per second, we're in excess of 100 and probably 20 pounds there versus our 40 pounds before. Okay, so putting two clicks into it. Two turns. Two, yep. turns, two yep. turns, two yep. turns. Um, that just al that allowed you to go from reaching that that point two seconds sooner. That exactly. Is what, okay, so it's yep. okay. So taking what we crave and desire for a feeling in the shock and just making it happen sooner is is super important. Like I said, when the nose is coming back down, or in the instance of say a big tire car in the back where we're maybe looking for separation we can really get that to pop off by closing that low speed bleed off on our compression because now instead of waiting for a high speed impact that shock is ready as it's at the line before we even hit the throttle it's ready to happen now which is super super cool by closing the low speed and opening the high speed right well essentially we're with these valve packs what we're doing is Behind those, there are some discs and springs, mm -hmm. and we're essentially putting preload on them. And so that shock oil that's flowing through when we are either compressing the shock or in the case of rebound, it's fighting against those. And so as we make turns, we're making that set of discs and springs even firmer because we're just pulling them tighter. And that's where that's fighting that. So can I give a couple examples that you can mm -hmm. give me? So say a car that we don't want the front end to drop. We want to tighten the front end up. We want the front wheel to come down slow, extend slow yep. off of the line. We're trying to hold the front end down instead of strapping it down. How would you attack that? Would that be closing the low speeds? Exactly, yep. So we're gonna close our low speed rebound and essentially that's gonna do the same thing as limiting it with a strap, right? Okay. We're, we're just holding that in the fender where we want it to be um, and just making that action stay consistent. And on the rear to get extension immediately like an RVW car or something uh -huh. and you want it to come down, slow down track, to get that extension you would open that low speed up or exactly. you would do all that through the high speed? You, would, you would do both. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good practice to adjust these simultaneously. And when I say that, I don't mean if you add add one click, you should add one turn. But, but making those adjustments hand in hand, because if we're wanting to speed up that extension, having our low speed rebound backed off more or open more is gonna allow that to happen a lot quicker and a lot sooner. And to keep it from dropping or coming down too quick on the compression, you're gonna tighten the low speed up as well as the high speed. Yep. So, I mean, that's kind of, just to put yeah. it in so people understand. Well, that's what I was going to say. In a real world, or going to ask, a real world example of that where it makes sense. Um, but that's interesting. It makes sense now that you say it. But mm -hmm. it's interesting that you aren't adjusting those in, like, you know, separated at different times. But they are working so hand in hand that I can see where you do. But I initially would think that you would work on them separately. You know, so that's... The high that's speed and low speed yeah. separately. Yeah. Yep. And that's a, you know, that's a great talking point for us. You know, we field a lot of calls 
people looking for help on how to tune these shocks mm -hmm. when they're at the track. And one of the first questions we always ask, you know, once we get past the what kind of car is it, is where are you at for settings on the shocks? And everybody always says, you know, a generic, oh, 15 clicks of rebound and 12 clicks of compression. And I go, okay, where are you at for your low speed bleed adjustments? And more often than not, I get a, a what? Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, they're just not familiar just with not, it or not comfortable with it. And it's just not, it's relatively new for the racer. For, I well, mean, for like the general pop, that public, these yeah. are accessible too. Yeah, I mean. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Oftentimes for people to get that sort of adjustment, that would be a conversation you would have with your shock builder. Right. And he right. would have to build it to that spec where now we can tackle it laying on the ground at the track, which is super, super cool. I guess that's oh, true. It's, it's something it's, that people didn't have the need to know prior to It's kind of no. like all the data that we gather through the Holly, mm -hmm. you know, or gathering. We just keep adding since there's more and more data. We used to race without that. But now we have the ability to see everything and tune everything. Mm -hmm. This is a tuning tool that you used to didn't have access to yeah. at the track. That's where a shock sensor, shock travel sensor, yep. I can see being really, really, yep. really valuable. Yep, so yep. That's interesting. Very okay. Cool. That puts okay. it in a perspective. I think that makes, yeah, I was going to say it makes a lot more sense. So. Very cool. Cool. All right, so we went from looking at low speed versus high speed and they're looking at that dyno. What is this? This, uh, this is our durability dyno. So we run this continuous. Uh, we'll run this for seven to ten days straight. We'll come in and check it. And what it is, is it's a sign on sign wave. So it's going up and down slowly and it's going uh, fast. So a smaller sign over a normal sine wave, right? Okay. So a lot of direction changes, um, and then it's going one inch up and one inch down, just like on the other dyno, but it's also cycling between them. So you get a lot of direction changes, so you can really check durability. I guess um, so. Okay. We learned a lot of this thing, right? Because you run it just continuous, so um, lots of time, lots of cycles, yeah. Okay, so you're going to go, you said you're going to try it, you're going to do different tests, durability and performance? performance yeah. Okay. So the dyno you looked at over here, we, that maxes out at like 15 inches per second. This we can go to 80. Okay. Yep. So quite a bit faster, right? So run a similar type test. We just run it a lot quicker over here. Okay. This is cool. But they're saying this has a blast cabinet around it. Yep. Because yep. you are testing to see if they stay together for some yep. of this stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we put the enclosure on there for safety, obviously. But honestly, it, it, all the failures are internal, right? It's like a disc will fail or crack. Okay. A bushing will wear out, something like that. So it's usually pretty, pretty um, lackluster. Yeah, like not a yeah, it's not a lot of excitement when there's a failure. And actually, something that's kind of interesting too that I didn't think about until we started running this, right, is when there's a shock failure, the shock will actually get colder. So we we the dyno we set the dyno to shut off when the temperature drops below a certain temperature, right? Because if you're not making damping force, you're not you're usually you're not building heat. Oh, that so makes instead sense. of over temp, it's really like if the shock gets too cold. Huh. Is when we turn it off. That's actually very interesting. That, I mean, it makes sense, but right, right, yeah. And then we've got an air cooler uh, behind it. There's like an air, uh, that little nozzle yeah. up there. It's like an air amplifier, so that just blasts air. So you're measuring the temperature of the oil right now. We measure the outside temperature of the body. Okay. So that infrared, that infrared sensor, that's okay. pointed at the body. Yep. We've done thermocouples in the shock a little bit, but not very much. Usually, we just use the we just use the temperature outside the surface of the shock body. Yep. Okay. It's so cool. I mean, you just don't think about what's involved and, you know, you build a shock with theory, but they practice it. I mean, they yeah. know if it's doing its thing. Yeah. And the, dur the durability. So the valves that would fail, it wouldn't be in the adjusters. It's the actual disc that's in the piston. That Usually, yep, yep. So like with the mod, uh, there's replenish valves in there that have springs. We, we had issues there early on in development. Um, certainly never let it get to production, but sure. yeah, yeah. Like on a traditional shock that has deflective disc on the piston, yeah, for sure. You can see cracking. Uh, yeah. Because those plates or valves are just yep. working back and forth. That steel is just flexing all yep. the time. You got it, yep. Yeah, with the mods, on the mod, in the adjuster packs, I don't think we ever really saw it. We never had any failures in the in the adjuster pack because it's that little poppet that's pushing against the spring. And there's really nothing moving in there during that cycle, is there? It is, yeah. The, it yeah, does move? yeah, the modules will. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. The modules will move back and forth, but the modules don't move, and it's not as I guess severe as maybe like deflective disc on a piston. Wow. Yep. So much to learn. Oh, the other the other cool one too is uh, 
there's a floating piston in the reservoir, right? So in here, kind of like, you know, traditional type shock, there's a X ring on a floating piston. So there's gas on one side, oil on the other. That's actually the first thing to wear out on these shocks. And I mean, it's like days and days and days of running. So huh. that's passing oil through the AN line, not gas. That's actually Correct. Yep. Yep. Oil only through the AN line. Yep. Yep. And all that does is make up for the rod displacement that goes in and out. That's all that does. Okay. Oh, okay. Yep. All right. And that wraps up this video. Thank you to QA1 and Max for taking us on a tour and teaching us all kinds of different stuff. You guys haven't noticed, there's a lot of magic that happens in this, but these are a great tuning element. If you want to learn more about Mod Series shocks, link below, highly suggest them. We personally run them on pretty much all of our projects at this point. Anyways, that is a wrap for this. Thank you guys for watching, and as always, be happy, go fast, and stay pretty. I will see you guys next time. So you come, you're in here too, then. you got okay. good. Are we all in that? Uh, you're really tall. Oh, I this, can probably. Like, it's okay. Are you good? Yeah. I feel smaller. Man, I feel giant. It's okay. You don't look. No, you're fine. Yeah, okay. I feel giant. Is that what you said? Well, yeah. you look small. Sure. Okay.